Good evening and welcome to episode 302 of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzaman Dungwa Kumalo. It is, of course, a very exciting evening. I'll get to why I'm so excited about uh, this evening's conversation and this evening's guest. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to the show. You are tuned into the only daily property podcast in South Africa. So do make sure that you also go to our Facebook and YouTube page to catch up on all the great content that we've already brought to your screens. And to all our regular viewers, you know how we do it every single weekday. At 7 p.m., you and I have an appointment where we're always, where I'm certainly always in conversation with a property expert who helps us navigate our property journey. Doesn't matter where you are in your property journey, we're certainly here to help you out. Whether you're a top fan, gang member, or of course, always sharing us on and showing us some love and sending those green hearts down here below. We absolutely love hearing from you at home. And you can also, of course, tune into our other great shows across private property social media pages as it is a Wednesday you can look forward to the first time home bias show with ST Carson that comes to screens this evening at 8 p.m. She's always in conversation uh, with people who've not only walked that first time home buying journey, but have gone on to grow their property portfolios from strength to strength. So if you're looking to get your foot in the property ladder and certainly scale your property portfolio, then that is a show that you also want to make sure you tune into to get a sense of how other people do it as they share some of their lessons learned, mistakes made, and things that you absolutely want to avoid. And every Tuesdays and Thursdays, this award-winning farmer Mbalinwapo comes to your screens and brings us the farming podcast where she tackles all things agriculture. So if you've got an interest in agriculture, perhaps want to uh, you know, be a farmer yourself. I know that a lot of people, especially in urban areas, are looking at different ways that they can you know, grow their own food, uh, especially as we look at you know, the, the advent of food security and, and just how difficult it's sometimes and how pricey uh, it sometimes can be for us to, to buy some of our food. So we're really looking at different ways we can cut costs as much as possible. So that is a show that you can tune into uh, that you can get matters relating to agriculture. Uh, You can certainly be able to get a better sense of how you can navigate that industry. And of course, every Mondays and Fridays, Chad comes to your screens with the Home Shoppers Show, where he's always giving us a great tour of amazing properties that you can find on www.privateproperty.co. Lots of Johannesburg to those very, very pricey mansions that I'm sure many of us at home want to eventually be able to live in. Chad certainly does have you covered. He certainly gives us a great sense of what we can expect in different properties. Those are the great shows that you can catch across private properties, social media platforms every single weekday at 8 p.m. Do make sure that you're always in touch with us. Follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on LinkedIn, and of course on TikTok. You can follow myself at Zamantunga underscore K on uh, Twitter as well as on Instagram. Now, I did say that I'm quite excited about this evening's conversation. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm a bit excited about it is because it really is one of those things that we've spoken about before, and now we need to look at what, how can we use this or work around the system beyond the time of crisis? Because every time we've spoken about this, uh, it has been in the context of the crisis that we're finding ourselves in right now, which is fantastic, and we certainly need to know how to do this thing. But how can we also make sure that we have the right systems in place outside of you know, a crisis? And what we're going to be looking at is the rental recovery packs. Uh, and if you remember, these were the packs that you know came out saying to the industry uh, when we went into lockdown last year. It was, uh, you know, you can find it on the TPN website. We've had Michelle Dickens from TPN, uh, as well as SSLR Incorporated. We've also had Silver Stain, who's my guest this evening, who've really spent quite a bit of time 
talking us through the, the lease packs. And we're going to hear shortly uh, from Silna, for viewers at home who probably weren't uh, you know, tuned in previously, what the rental recovery pack was, uh, the need for it, and, and whether or not we can still use it to date. You know, is there still uh, a need for the uh, rental recovery pack? And of course, different ways that uh, you can deal with crisis or certainly your tenant not being able to pay, how can you enter into an arrangement with them? Uh, and of course, we've brought none other than Silna Stain to help us best make sense of this. Silna, good evening and thank you so much for joining us on the show. Hi, good evening. So much, thank you so much for having me again. It's always so much fun to, to spend seven o'clock with you. <laughs> It's always such a pleasure to, to have you on the show, Silna, especially because you're really able to, to, to have us understanding what the law says in an accessible way. Because I think oftentimes when it comes to legal matters, particularly property matters, you know, a, a lot of tenants tend to just generally not know these things because nobody teaches, this, uh, teaches us this. We don't go to law school. Not everybody needs to go to law school. I did law school. I can tell you now you're not missing out on anything. And I think many landlords were also then finding that they, you know, they start Started their property investment journey often accidentally, and they themselves also don't quite know, you know, the ambits of the law, what you can or cannot do. So understanding what can and cannot be done, particularly with you know people's monies and uh, when they can't you know, pay, is such a crucial thing for us to understand. And, and and I want us to, you know, the starting point for our conversation, Sona. I want um, if you can share with our listeners, you know, what the rental recovery pack is and and why yourselves and TPN came together and saw a need for for this um, lease pack, for this rental pack. It's such a good conversation to have, Samatua. When you um, when we started discussing this episode and what we're going to be doing, I thought, wow, it's amazing. I can't believe it's been more than a year um, since we, we released the rent recovery packs. And and to be quite honest, I didn't even know um, that people are still interested in that and that there's still questions around it. So I'm, I'm very happy that we're having this conversation. The reason why uh, we did that was last year, March, we realized oh, in order, um, things are going pear-shaped here and we are probably going to head into, uh, into a lockdown. Uh, Michelle Dickens and I had a conversation and we said, whoa, okay, if people are going to be prohibited from leaving their homes and they can't trade, they can't earn an income, how do we, how do we help this? What do we do? Should a tenant stop paying rent? Remember uh, last year, March, April, there was a lot of conversation about the obligation to pay rent. And um, a lot of countries, not a lot, not a lot, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. A few countries did have the ability to support um, tenants and they paid rent on behalf of tenants. Unfortunately, South Africa is obviously not one of those countries. We don't have deep enough pockets for that. And unfortunately, um, there was no uh, government support when it came to rentals. So what we did is we allowed, uh, we drafted this documentation to allow a landlord and tenant to talk to each other, meet each other halfway, and then um, pay a, either a deferred payment, so a reduced amount to pay later, or completely reduced amount um, not to be, be repaid. And the way the documentation was drafted was specifically with COVID and lockdown in mind. Now, the thing is, at the time, uh, luckily, uh, we, we already sort of foreseen the situation where we're not going to be in lockdown only for three months and where the national state of disaster wouldn't have been for three months. So just for the viewers, the reason why the original state of disaster was only for three months is that is what the provisions of the Disaster Management Act of South Africa says. You declare a state of disaster for three months which can be extended or reduced uh, by the minister. And it's been extended to this very day and probably um, every month on the 15th of every month, we just have a month's extension. And that is in terms of the um, Disaster Management Act. So it's very important to know that the content of that agreements were 
there is a provision and it's a defined term recovery date. And the recovery date is specifically defined as three months after the end of the national state of disaster. Now, where we are currently is still in that same national state of disaster. So we still haven't reached the recovery date in terms of those, um, of those documents. We did allow for cancellation of the agreement because we knew it's going to probably take longer. And the reason why this is relevant is repayment of the uh, reduced amounts uh, or the deferred amounts would only kick in from recovery date. And we allow for cancellation in terms of those agreements if it extended, which it did. Um, and the landlord says, you're, you're okay, but I can't. Um, keep on supporting you. You need to start repaying. There is an, a, a, a provision for cancellation. That was a very long explanation. I'm sorry. And I think the, the, the big thing about it is it's really getting a, an understanding of that there was meant to be an end date. Um, initially, I mean, we saw very quickly that we're not going to be in a 21-day lockdown. And so we thought, okay, maybe it will be that three-month window period. And we also very quickly saw that actually it's not going to be the case. And because we've had so many different extensions, because we're still in, in, in the national state of disaster, um, the wording then becomes quite important because it would have meant that initially you had a, you know, three months after the recovery date, meaning probably the end of the national state of disaster, then payment can resume or regular payment uh, or back to the original amount, except we still haven't gone back to it. Uh, meaning that nobody would have anticipated that that would still be the case um, so many months later. So now that we have a good sense, certainly of the timeline uh, provision, because I think that's actually a very important starting point that this isn't, this wasn't something that was there previously to this, and that we had envisioned that an end date would, uh, you know, coincide with when the national state of disaster would end. It hasn't ended, so we're still living um, within within that ambit. When we then consider that, so um, how do landlords, especially now, how can can they make use of, of the lease pack? Because as we're saying that there isn't, we don't have a date, right? As much as we're seeing vaccinations, um, you know, coming in and, you know, even younger age groups being able to vaccinate, the reality is that by November, December, chances are we're still going to be living in a state of national disaster very well into the new year. So in the event where landlords are finding that some of their tenants and even a new tenant because i think one of the the realities of having been living in this new normal for such a long time is your previous tenants lease agreement may have potentially ended by now perhaps that same tenant has re renewed it perhaps you've now gotten a new tenant uh, whichever one it is but you are essentially now in the middle of another lease agreement for argument's sake or in the middle of the one that you had last year so in the event where a tenant right now is struggling to then pay how can they make use of um, the lease pack given that the uh, we still have a limitation on you know the end the end date so to speak or when payments or regular payments can resume yes so the rent recovery pack specifically it's it's still free and it's still available on on tpn's website so anybody can go and download it and read it the problem with with those documentation right now is well there are two one is the uh, deposit utilization agreement and to be honest that was an agreement that was drafted um with, with the good old term desperate times calls for desperate measures um i i would never ever 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 unless it's in a crisis crisis mode like we were last year march april um i would never suggest that a landlord and a tenant agrees to release the deposit so basically agree that no deposit will be held so the tenant can use that for payment of rent the reason why it was relevant last year is we knew that the actual full lockdown would only be for let's call it a month, max two months. And and thank goodness we were correct in that prediction. Whew, dodged a dodged a bullet. <laughs> um, but it's a it it was a very necessary 
I, I almost want to use the word evil, but I don't mean that it was evil. That you don't want to go through a rental transaction without a deposit. But in a situation where there would be no cash, the landlord wouldn't have been able to pay the bond. Tenant really doesn't have an income. Let's say the tenant um, was a nail technician and she couldn't work. She really just were, weren't allowed to work. No income. Landlord, let's say, for instance, also had a similar job um, and, and really couldn't earn an income. The only money that could flow at that time was the deposit. So where we are now, we don't have full lockdown. We're in level four. It's strict. And I mean, um, two weeks uh, for the first two weeks of this lockdown, level four, restaurants were closed. Where at this stage, luckily, they are open still with the alcohol ban, we obviously have less um, patrons, but there isn't any, um, really, any person who isn't allowed to earn an income. I know there are people that are struggling, but there isn't a strict limitation like we had last year, March, April. For that reason, I would not, I would not suggest the uh, deposit utilized agreement unless there's a very specific reason for a very short-term um, uh, inability to pay rent and the deposit can be used. The other document being the um, rent recovery document, it's the rent deferment agreement. That can be used. Let's take, for example, the, the tragedy that hit us last week, where there are people who, um, as a result of the looting, and, and the burning down of, of shops and, and full destruction of, of um, businesses. If somebody for that reason now is going to go into a two or three months period where they will not be able to, to meet their rental obligation, they can still use those agreements, but be very careful of using them as is. Reason why I'm saying this is, the Rent Recovery Pact specifically makes mention of COVID and the, the pandemic and the effect of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the looting um, and, and the destruction of property there that, that we've seen last week, unfortunately, it's not going to be a perfect fit in the Rent Recovery Pact and the deferred agreements. What you do have and what I do suggest is... As part of the lease pack, and unfortunately, the, the lease pack is not free as the rent recovery packs are, but it's at a, at a particularly um, uh, awesome cost for the, for the kind of documentation that you have in that pack. I am, I am personally uh, one of the drafting attorneys of, of those uh, lease documentation, so I know them pretty well. And uh, I've even translated them to Afrikaans. I really know them well. Um, <laughs> so in terms of those documentations, uh, uh, documentation, we do have addendums and we do have um, AODs, acknowledgement of dates. And I would rather suggest use something like that. Say, for instance, you're a landlord, and you have a tenant um, that, that doesn't earn an income right now because of either COVID, lockdown level four, or the destruction of property last week, whatever the situation might be. Mm. I would look at something like that. Potentially do an addendum to reduce the rental amount for a set period of time. If you want them to repay that, use it in conjunction with the acknowledgement of that to say, okay, your rent was supposed to be 10, it's seven now, um, the 3,000 rands, you're going to have to repay that at some stage. Use that then in, an, in the acknowledgement of debt um, rather than try to make it work with the uh, rent recovery bucks. If the reason for um, inability to pay actually does go to lockdown level four, more than welcome. And the, the rent recovery pack still sits perfectly well. And like I said, it's free to download. So before you start wondering what to do, download the thing, read it, see if you can, can make it work.
Mm. I'm in conversation this evening with Silna Stein, who is the Managing Director at SSOR Incorporated. We're looking at rental lease packs. So if you're a landlord or even a tenant, because I was saying to Silna off air, one of the things that I'm realizing is that, you know, tenants themselves also don't know some of their rights and sometimes don't know what kind of resources they can use uh, to communicate with their landlord in the event where they are unable to make rental and there's, you know, there's been a genuine crisis and you want to be able to uh, put a put a legal document uh, in place so that your landlord also doesn't think that you're trying to pull a fast one on them. So this is also relevant for tenants because it equips you with the knowledge of you know being able to go to a landlord and say, you I'm currently in a difficult financial position. It could be because of COVID or um, you know something else. And there's this thing that can be used. Uh, for us to be able to enter into an agreement uh, as opposed to just having a verbal agreement because we we'll always say get things in writing when it comes to you know your, your landlord and tenant relationship. It's not enough to just have a conversation about it. So as a tenant, you're now also able to have the knowledge to be able to raise this with your landlord. And I want to find out from you at home, especially when it comes to you know, rental, from the tenant side, have you been able to approach your landlord uh, in the event where you've struggled to make rent for the month and what has generally been their reception. And this could have been because of COVID uh, or, of course, other life circumstances. Because as we were saying, so many things have unfortunately happened over the past year that uh, it could very well happen that it's not directly due to COVID, but your finances have been affected and you unfortunately won't be able to make rent. And to the landlords, I want to find out from you, how do you handle it when your, you know, your tenants message you to say, I won't be able to make rent. Do they even contact you prior to the first? Because I know some landlords would be like, look, it's now the third and they still my tenant is still not paid. So how do you approach your tenant in the event where rental hasn't been paid? Do you have a system in place where, you know, come the second and you saw that there was no rent in place, you just send the standard letter of demand? Or are you more, I'll first have a conversation, find out, hey, what's happening? Have you forgotten? Uh, do share with us down below how you manage uh, late rental payment, whether you're the tenant making the late payment or, of course, the landlord receiving that late payment. Payment. Now, so now one of the things that we've also then seen with um, rental and the way that we've you know, seen the rental market uh, over the past year is that many places, their, their rental amounts have significantly dropped uh, quite a lot. They've obviously also seen very high vacancy rates in certain, um, in certain cities. And one of the things that I've seen, you know, sometimes tenants do is wanting to leave their current place prior to the lease uh, expiring. And sometimes it could be because, let's say, for example, their finance is affected and they just will no longer be able to make that rental. Sometimes it's actually because rental in that apartment block used to be 10,000 and now because of the state of you know the rental market it's gone down to 7,000 and they'd rather just get that place which is the same complex so they're still in the same place uh, and save that 3,000 rands for themselves so they want to cancel um, a lease early perhaps take us through the the risk of cancellation because one of the trends that I keep seeing is tenants saying, I want to cancel you know, my lease or I need somebody to take over my lease. I think we see that a lot. And, and I always, you know, I, I always just shake when everybody say, when I see, especially tweets who, of people asking for, you know, a tenant because they want somebody to take over their lease. Perhaps, you know, take us through any cancellation and of course, how actually tenants can't uh, their lease. Yes, so I'm very happy that we're having this conversation because mm. it breaks my heart every single time I see cases come through through to SSLR and we need to um, imp uh, actually get a judgment against the tenant in terms of the lease agreement for the early cancellation penalty. And um, we do, and we are successful with those uh, every single time. Unfortunately, the tenant at the time of cancelling doesn't know that they are going to be in for, for these costs. Let's, let's take, for example, a gym contract. If you cancel your gym, uh, your gym contract and you still need to pay uh, for two or three months, it's usually not 
you know, it's not going to break the bank as a rental does. Because what happens is you do have a right in terms of Section 14 of the Consumer Protection Act. The consumer, in our context, obviously the tenant, does have the right to cancel that agreement by giving the supplier, in our context, the landlord, 20 business days notice of this cancellation. Now, where people go wrong with this is they believe that if they give longer notice, so instead of the 20 business days, they give three months notice or two months notice or whatever, that that's going to um, remove their obligation to pay this early cancellation penalty. That's not the case. The Act says give the, the suppliers, so the landlord, at least 20 business days notice, then you can cancel the agreement. But the supplier, the landlord, may impose a reasonable cancellation penalty. And then the Act gives us a few pointers uh, that you need to consider. Those pointers typically relate to um, situations where the parties did not agree to an early cancellation penalty. Now, in most, most lease agreements, we do make provision for an early cancellation penalty. And in most cases, it's going to be about two to four months rent. So if you consider a lease agreement that's been running for, say, it's a year lease agreement and you're in month eight. Now you see the flat next to you go, up, uh, uh, you know, uh, freeze up and it's going to be cheaper. But you're going to be in for three months early cancellation penalty. And eventually you're going to end up paying rent at the new place, but you're also going to pay um, early cancellation penalty at the previous place. You very often end up in a worse or financial position than in a better position. And, and I think this is the scary part. You need to look at the terms of your lease agreement. Now, I say this with the necessary respect to the rental housing tribunal. Um, but I think it's very important to mention a lot of times when people go to the tribunal to, um, to, to complain about the early cancellation penalty, some of the tribunals, especially in the Western Cape, does not like to give orders in terms of this early cancellation penalty. And the problem is, remember, guys, the rental housing tribunal is not a court. It's a statutory body created by the Rental Housing Act. And uh, they can be reviewed and they can be corrected uh, by a higher court like the Madge Court or the High Court. And we've seen that in, in cases. So don't believe because you were successful once in the tribunal that the next landlord you go to, the bargain on the fact that they're going to go to the tribunal and that that tribunal commissioner is going to give the same order, because if they go to court, and, and I mean, we've done um, a lot of these cases, and, and we are successful in enforcing the rights that the landlord have in terms of the lease agreement, you could end up with a judgment against your name, which you could have avoided. I mean, you could have avoided all that drama um, and court cases and legal costs. And, and let's be fair, eventually, to end up with a judgment against your name is going to mess around with cell phone contracts, with clothing accounts. Not that I'm a fan of that, but it's yeah. going to mess with, with so many things. So, so try to avoid that. But the way to avoid that is not by finding a new tenant. There is no obligation on a landlord to accept the tenant that you introduce to him. The landlord has the complete right and discretion to decide on the tenant that he's going to contract with. All lease agreements yeah. has a provision that says this agreement may not be ceded or assigned. That means you can't just say, oh, Mr. Landlord, yes, my good friend, Zamatungwa, she is going to move in and she's going to be your tenant. Now you're going to love her. She's, so, she's a pleasant, pleasant lady. Um, that is not the way to get away from the early cancellation penalty. Definitely not. Quite to the contrary, I've seen a lot of tenants do that and the landlord does not accept that tenant, which he has the right not to, if the tenant ticks the boxes on, um, 
on credit rating and everything checks out, I must say, there is, uh, there is definitely an obligation on the landlord to mitigate his damages. So the landlord can't, <laughs> for lack of a better word, this is what you said in the beginning, Samatungwa, I have a way with legal terminology. The landlord can't just be stubborn and spiteful um, and upset with you and not place the tenant. Um, if you can show that the landlord did have an opportunity to mitigate his damages and he did not, he's going to have an uphill battle in court um, to get that early cancellation penalty from you. But if the friend that you want to place does not fit the landlord's vetting criteria, he doesn't have to place it. Mm. And I think you. I, I know that we're running out of time because this is a topic that I want us to adequately flesh out because I know that a lot of tenants often feel, uh, I'll say, disempowered or don't quite know uh, how to then go about it in the event where they do want to end their lease agreement early. And the reality, and both of, both of us know this one, Silna, is that often tenants just don't read their lease agreements. Uh, often landlords themselves don't, you know, read the lease agreements. Uh, they, typically will download them from the internet. And sometimes even when they use uh, one, that the, the TPN lease, even when they use that, they still haven't actually gone through the whole uh, lease agreement to understand every clause uh, that is there. So we know that both parties are guilty of not reading the lease agreement. Um, and so really getting a good sense then of how can a tenant be able to get out of a lease early and, and not pay um, you know, the, the early cancellation amount or certainly try to pay as little as possible and, and using uh, the legal ambits to be able to do so. But that's going to be a conversation that you and I are going to pick up on uh, on another day. Before I let you go then, Silna, I think any final tips for both landlords and uh, tenants when it comes to using the, uh, recovery, um, the, the recovery pack, especially right now, and knowing that we don't have an end date to, um, you know, the national state of disaster and, Every, there's been so many different types of crises that have unfortunately happened. And we'll say due to us, you know, being in a pandemic and of course the economic effects. So even part of what we saw, you know, last week, uh, we could also say that the fact that it's during COVID certainly played a role in things getting to where they are. So knowing that we're likely still going to be facing uh, financial difficulty in particular. Any final tips for both landlord and tenant and how they can both, uh, certainly best use the uh, the rental recovery pack? I'm so glad. If every time somebody asks me this question, I get so excited. If I can use the word Ubuntu in any conversation, I am a very happy camper. Mm. So... Ubuntu, I, I, I don't think we ever let me say anything and I don't sneak in Ubuntu. Um, the reason why I'm such a such an absolute fan um, of application of Ubuntu in, in our law and specifically in rentals is in a case like this, where we are now, and it's not a short thing. We've been in this for 18 months and, and like you rightly said, it leads to further things and difficult times and, and things are happening. People need to appreciate whether you're a landlord or a tenant. Everybody in this transaction is human. If there's a company, there's a human behind that company. If it's a trust, whatever the case is, we are people and we are people in one community. We share a community. So for tenants, to say, I don't want to pay my rent because I can't, so the landlord must carry me financially, is really not fair because the landlord also has obligations to me. Other way, a landlord that says, well, you know what, I can get this rental income and my tenant must not make a plan. And mm -hmm. that's also not ideal. Although legally enforceable and all, although it's correct in law, in practice, we are going through a time that our generation has never gone through. This is not the first time this happens in the history of the world. Let's be fair, everything that, you know, that's happening has happened before. And, you know, nothing is really new. But it's our generation's first time of going through a very difficult thing. And as long as landlords and tenants Remember to communicate, communicate, communicate. And don't communicate, tenants, please don't communicate when the pawpaw is in the fan. 
that's a little too late. C communicate when you realize, oh, ooh, the poor boy is heading towards the fan. This is, again, my amazing legal terminology. Um, mm. So when you realize there's a problem and you're going to run into a situation, if you're a business owner and you're a tenant and you can see your business is failing, open the conversation with the landlord then. Because if you start talking to each other before there's a rear rental, both parties are still happy to talk to each other. If you're on month three of not paying your rent, I promise you the landlord doesn't feel very, um, you know, happy to help you. Um, talk in advance. And if you then come to a conclusion, use an agreement, use something like the rent recovery pack um, to do a deferred payment. Use the TPN lease pack documentation. Use the um, addendums and the acknowledgements of that to record your agreement in writing. And if all else fails, cancel the agreement, but give the landlord sufficient notice. And then landlord, you need to mitigate your damages. There's a legal obligation on you to start marketing the property immediately. If it's necessary, even reduce the rent, because if you're in a, in a complex where the rent went from 65,000 rand a month to 42,000 rand a month for all the units. If you're still trying to get your 65, I'm exaggerating obviously, but if you're still trying to get that rent, but everybody else in the complex have dropped their rent, um, you're not mitigating your damages. If you reduced your rent, obviously that rent reduction would be part of the early cancellation penalty and the damages suffered by the landlord. But you need to communicate as quickly as possible and uh, talk to each other. Try to avoid the um, very short uh, WhatsApps. Actually, pick up the phone, talk to each other, and and see if you can find a solution. Mm. And that's such a great place uh, to leave it on. That's a great note to leave it on, Solna, this evening. That you really want to meet each other halfway as much as possible. If you're the landlord and your tenant has come, uh, you know, forward saying that, listen, I know I likely won't be able to, you know, pay in future. I'd rather, you know, cancel. Let's say two months' time, so I'll still pay the next two months' rental. But I'd rather, for the sake of my finances, uh, end the lease agreement in time get into sourcing a new tenant as opposed to trying to be unreasonable with them. And I think from the tenant side as well is you want to be as forthcoming as possible uh, during this period. I know that it's such a difficult one. I think beyond some of the, the anxiety and the stresses uh, of living in South Africa and not being vaccinated because I'm, I'm seeing, a lot, I'm very jealous. I'm seeing a lot of friends abroad who are my age. They were long vaccinated. <laughs> then when we add all of those collective stresses, there's also, of course, just the burden of um, how all of this is also taking the toll in our mental health. Out. So you really just want to be forthcoming as early as possible and also get into gear mode uh, in terms of sol solving it for yourself and finding that cheaper place um, and moving in there as soon as possible. Because I think it is one of those things that right now, a lot of us are trying to find different ways to cut costs as much as possible. Uh, and in the event where we're able to make a little bit extra money, put it aside because we don't know if things are going to get bad at all. But so now, so now we are going to leave it there this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, so much, and we're always a pleasure to be with you. And that is Silna Stein, who is the Managing Director at SSLR Incorporated. And that is the end of the Wednesday edition of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzamantungwa Kumalo. I'll be back on your screens tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. It is a Wednesday, so you can look forward to the first time home buy show with SC Klassen at 8 p.m. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe.
Hi, I'm Brian Kepper. I'm a 10 time South African motorcycling champion. My family and I have chosen to live in four ways. There's some really great suburbs in our neighborhood. There's a lot of families living in the surrounding areas in places like Lone Hill and Cedar Lakes. What draws people to Cedar Lakes is that it's so close to the Broadacre Shopping Centre, Cedar Square and Four Ways Life Hospital. Lone Hill is a major draw card for many families. It's got some great smaller commercial centres and some fantastic schools like Crawford College. From an entertainment point of view, Monte Cassino really comes alive at night. There's so much on the go, and there's an incredible energy in the area. Our family just loves the fast-paced lifestyle that Four Ways brings. But honestly, the thing that attracted us most to this area was the active lifestyle that it offers. As a family, we've chosen to live in Four Ways because of the lifestyle and convenience, and this is our neighborhood.